A man walks the streets of an East German city on a cold and windy day, until a poster steers his thoughts to vacations, sunshine and the sea. Well, I guess it won't hurt to ask at the German travel agency, he thinks, but where to go? Da gibt es vielerlei Möglichkeiten. Ostsee, Thüringen, Harz, Ostsee, Harz, Thüringen, Ostsee. So these were clips from an actual East German advertisement for the German travel agency. And it kind of makes fun of the limited possibilities you really have within East Germany. One being the Baltic Sea, the other being Thüringen or Thuringia as it's called in English. And the last one being the Harz Mountains. And well, that is basically where I went a few weeks ago and I now went on a second trip. So I think it'd be fun if you just follow me along. We will go on a treasure hunt through East Germany, looking for equipment made before the reunification of the country. Along the way, we will discover a bunch of lost places and also have a closer look at an abandoned property that I have an interest in. We will then bring all the tools back home to the workshop and repair them. So let's get going then. For your orientation, here are some maps of Germany in the middle of the 1970s. Germany was divided into the Federal Republic of Germany in the west and the GDR or German Democratic Republic to the east. These areas even further to the east belonged to Germany before World War II and are officially labeled as under Polish administration on this map. Germany had not yet completely given up on them. This is however not the subject of this video and we will not get anywhere near those areas on this trip anyway. Here is a map of the major highways and another one of the major railroad lines at the time. My journey begins in Köln, also known as Cologne, in the west of Germany and our destination are the beautiful Harz Mountains with the first stop being around the town of Nordhausen which is not that far behind the old east-west border. The actual trip from Cologne was about a four hour ride, but we're skipping over most of it as we want to further explore East Germany and collect East German tools and equipment. The area around Nordhausen here close to Bleicherode is really scenic and beautiful. Green fields and meadows, hills and forests galore. And I took a break to enjoy the scenery. After that, I arrived in the city of Nordhausen where I picked up an assortment of East German wrenches that we will restore later in this video. I wanted to pick up more items in a nearby village, but had to wait two hours for the owner to come home from work. So I decided to fill the gap by visiting the IFA Museum in Nordhausen. The museum is mostly dedicated to the IFA diesel engines and tractors that were built here during the days of the GDR. This early machine here reminds me of the walking tractor I bought when I came to this part of Germany last time. This tractor is powered by an old two-stroke engine that looks like the historic predecessor of the Barkas engines I worked on in that episode. The museum also displays a few locomotives and IFA trucks which have a special place in my heart. Just a detail, but still a really neat idea is this fountain outside the museum. By the way, these are parts of a V2 rocket and there is not much of that on display here, but well, it's important to know that Nordhausen is most famous or infamous rather for the fact that the V2 rockets were built near this town in an underground facility. So those two hours went by faster than I had thought and I was back on the road to the nearby village of Heringen where I picked up these three awesome bunker lamps made in East Germany. Made from cast aluminium and especially in this mint condition they are sought after collector's items, virtually unobtainable in West Germany. We will inspect them in the workshop once we are back home. At this point I had been on the road almost the entire day and the evening was drawing closer. I had once again booked a room in Quedlinburg, which is on the other side of the mountain range. But instead of taking the boring route on the highway around the hills, I wanted to drive right through the forest on the old back roads in the hope of exploring things along the way. And boy, was I in for a treat.
By the roadside, I had noticed the remains of a burnt-out Mercedes parked across what seemed like the long-since overgrown access road to our large compound, clearly dating back decades. A creek could be heard nearby, and the place seemed eerie and also very peaceful at the same time. My general impression of this entire region is that there are a lot of wounds from the past, but since so many people have left these parts over the past three decades, and with so many industrial operations long since abandoned, nature has had a lot of time to reclaim what once belonged to her. This gigantic building looks like it was either never finished or someone started to renovate it and gave up somewhere along the way. I can only guess here, but maybe this was a hotel or a resort at one point in the past. If you have any guesses, leave a comment under the video. Scattered around the main building are lots of other structures that have almost completely fallen apart. The roofs of many of those structures have collapsed. I'm not going inside since I'm here alone and nobody even knows I'm here. I don't usually walk inside buildings that are collapsing. I could be buried alive or fall down a hole and that will be the end of it. Around the main building there are more burnt out vehicles. Since we all have watched too many movies people might suggest that this was done to erase evidence. But there are less radical possibilities. Maybe this area was used by the local firefighters as a training ground. Or perhaps whoever owns or owned this place used this property to park broken cars to maybe fix them or sell them one day. He then parked the old Mercedes right across the access road to block people from driving past the gate. But then he never found the time to take care of all those vehicles or maybe he's just out of the picture now. Later some of the kids who broke into the buildings and vandalized them set the broken cars on fire. That's at least what I would expect. But I had to leave this place behind before there would be no sunlight left. As I was riding over the hills to get to the northern side of the Harz, I saw more abandoned looking houses in various states of decay. Even if one were interested in buying one of these properties, the difficulties would begin with even tracking down the owners. But more about that in a minute. I eventually arrived in Quedlinburg and spent the night in this beautiful medieval city. If you are interested in seeing a little more of its beauty, you should watch the video about my last trip from a few weeks ago. I posted the link under this video. In a nearby village called Gröningen, located a few kilometers to the north, I picked up these two awesome toolboxes packed to the brim with old East German hand tools. They will be restored in this video as well. For my next stop I actually had to turn around back into the Harz mountains to a town called Thale, which was also advertised in the old GDR film you saw at the beginning of this video. Thale is still very touristy today, but there are good reasons for it, as you will see. The next score was this massive lab power supply made by Statron in the late 70s. We will have a closer look at it back home. And there were more things to pick up. But since I was in Thale already, I thought I might have a look at some of the local attractions. An old Trabi, parked by the side of the road, had advertised the GDR Museum. In German, DDR Museum. The museum has a number of rooms that are supposed to represent different aspects of life throughout the decades here in East Germany. This room here for example is the workplace of a Stasi officer. Other rooms give you an idea of the life of everyday citizens of the GDR. And there also is a collection of vintage items including TVs, radios, stereo systems and computers made in East Germany. I don't want to spoil everything though and I will simply show a few impressions and I recommend to go there yourself if you can. Maybe the biggest attraction in Thale and a must on a trip to the Harz is to take the cable car up to the Hexentanzplatz, meaning place of the witches dance. We are basically taking a shortcut up to the mountain top where that place is located as we get to watch down from far above the treetops as a creek is gently winding its way through the valley below. In the distance you can see a single house, I believe it is an inn, sitting in a gorge next to the extremely steep side of the mountain. As we climb higher 
we pass by some interesting rock formations. As you can tell, I'm a big fan and especially if you can catch one of the cars with a glass floor, you're in for a treat. The surrounding area is just stunning and the view is breathtaking. Once you arrive on the mountaintop, you will find all kinds of tourist attractions and there are witches, in German Hexen, depicted everywhere. It is believed that it was once a pagan cult site where celebrations were held to honor the forest and mountain goddesses. Even though I must say that the only magical thing I found on my trip here is the stunning beauty of the landscape and the creative ways we have come up with to enjoy it. I still had some more items to pick up but still had some time until my next appointment so I thought I might as well take a ride on the alpine slide while I'm here. And while I'm usually not the biggest customer of amusement parks and the like, I've always loved the idea of just flying by through the forest on a beautiful day like this one. But not long after this, I was back on the road to pick up the last collection of items on my list. I found someone who saved tons of old maps and materials from an East German school. Many of them had beautiful depictions of engineering principles and pieces of technology. East German educational books and materials had a very good name back in the day and you will understand once we have a look at this back at the workshop. Before I actually drove home, another rather important thing happened though. While driving through all these villages in this remote part of the country, you will see interesting abandoned buildings everywhere. And I mentioned before that it can be hard to even find out who even owns these places. Well, while picking up one of my items, I talked to someone who was looking for a buyer for a 10,000 square meter or two and a half acre piece of land that nobody had really taken care of in 20 years. We drove to the property together and I was left to explore it on my own because, well, the owner were, for physical or mental reasons, I guess, not prepared to actually fight their way through the bushes and see the state of the property firsthand. So, well, I went there and filmed everything and I'm going to show the footage at the end of this episode. But first, let's get back home to the workshop and have a look at all those beautiful items. Let us have a look at this educational material then. We are talking about 10 maps that I brought home from East Germany. They are prints on paper but glued to fabric as you might remember from your own school days if you're old enough that is. Maybe you're not sure what to expect but let me tell you this is fantastic stuff. Let me show you everything and maybe we can also talk a little bit about some of the details. The first poster depicts various electronic devices and inventions. The casual observer could dismiss this as an assortment of completely unrelated objects. But in reality, this is a rather genius depiction and comparison of alternating current sources. It has a principal drawing or schematic for every one of these devices as well as a beautiful depiction and it also compares the various source voltages. In my opinion this is an example of fantastic educational material and I might even use this in a future video. Let's have a look at the next map. Again, a beautiful painting combined with a principal explanation of the main components of a hydroelectric power plant. I mean, isn't this absolutely stunning? I know I would have loved it if we had ever talked about anything nearly as interesting when I went to school. The lot that I bought home actually had two of LED tubes, at least temporarily. After doing that, I also detached the old Nava starters and replaced them with the ones that came with the LED ones. For this purpose, I have ordered these two Philips brand LED tubes. Unfortunately, one of the tubes was already broken when it was delivered here. One of the metal pins had broken loose inside the packaging. I tried to install it nonetheless, but it didn't work, of course. So I had to replace the second one with another no name LED tube that I had lying on the shelf. The color of the light should be roughly the same though. This goes to show that these old bunker lamps can be used with modern replacements. They need much less energy, but I can also tell you from first hand experience that at least the no name tubes do not last very long. In the four years I've been in my current workshop, I had to replace many of them 
two or three times already. The higher quality ones might last much longer though. And this is also a way how these lamps could be used in 120 volt countries. And of course you also need to test the other two. And of course we also need to test the other two. As you can see, all tubes and starters still work. Just amazing. So let's have a look at all those old hand tools then. The first lot that I bought was simply a bunch of wrenches that had been thrown in this cardboard box here. In order to get some kind of overview, I started to order all those tools in three piles. Number one, GDR tools. Number two, Eastern Block States and yet unidentified tools. Number three, modern tools that didn't really belong in this collection. And these piles keep on growing here because you remember there is more where that came from. And I proceed by emptying out this black toolbox. It actually looks like it was completely made by hand by whoever owned this box back in the day. It even comes with a custom made inlay to hold various bits and branches of different sizes. Whoever used this toolbox had a need for all kinds of punches and odds and ends. The blue toolbox has a similar style, but unlike the black box, it was clearly made in a factory. It contains some really neat East German tools that I hadn't seen before. Some of them in really good shape. We will have a closer look at all these items once we have been taking care of everything. For that purpose I have set up these two buckets. One contains citric acid, the other one soapy water. Not everything fits all at once, so I had to do this in several batches. But long story short, the GDR tools and the blue box were submerged in acid right away, while the black toolbox, being super greasy and grimy, was washed in the soapy water first. The other tools, some of which were as of yet unidentified, were also put into the acid bath later on. After being in there for a few days, and the duration depends very much on the concentration and also the ambient temperature, by the way. They were rinsed off with water and left in the sun to dry for a few hours. The same had also happened to the East German tools. After that, I cleaned every item manually and finally applied a thin film of ballastol. Since most of these tools are not chrome plated, I think it is advisable to oil them. The formerly blue toolbox had lost almost all of the original paint in the acid bath. This doesn't happen to more rugged types of paint, by the way. With the blue paint gone, I applied a new coat of hammerite here. The other toolbox has a certain post-apocalyptic charm and I want to keep it that way. That's why I decided not to paint it at all. Some of the old aluminium rivets had broken off though they must have corroded being in direct contact with those brass piano hinges. So I decided to punch out the remains of the old rivets. I can't say how old this box really is but making your own toolbox like that would at least fit very well with the East German realities of the Cold War decades. And here is an overview of all the clearly identifiable GDR items from within this collection. The vast majority of these wrenches are branded WFR, VFR or VFA, which is short for Werkzeugfabrik Radebeul, meaning tool factory at the town of Radebeul. A few of them still have the original blue hammer paint and I left that intact. It's actually funny that they even punched the name of that factory onto this little Allen key here. Voltus brand screwdrivers and lots of tools with the Schmalkalder and WMW logos on them. It also goes for the pliers. I'm actually impressed how ruggedly designed they are. This ruler has the Massi logo on it short for VEB Bass Industrie, with a factory in the city of Werdau. I'm afraid that none of these factories exist anymore though. Now, all these tools here were rather obviously made in the GDR. And these are the better known brands from back in the day. The second set of tools that I'm now presenting is a little more mixed and even more obscure.
VBW or VBW, which still exists, is short for Vereinigte Bäckersche Werkzeugfabriken, Bäckers Unified Tool Factories, now a subsidiary of the Stahlwille Group, and it is a tool manufacturer from Wuppertal, which is in West Germany. VEB Ankerwerk was a name that apparently existed only between 1947 and 1956, It consisted of various factories that had been nationalized by Forrest. One of them was what is now called Heller Tools, co-inventors of cemented carbide and carbide drills. About these two I'm not sure to be honest. There was a Kampmann factory after the reunification of Germany back in 91 or so, but I don't know how far the name goes back. There are Omega Tools for sale online and the sellers say they are from World War II but I couldn't confirm this so far. Verus, on the other hand, was a typical GDR brand name. The big wrench here was made in the Soviet Union. The second one, I'm not sure about. There are a few people in East Germany selling vintage tools with this name on them online. And judging by the name, this could have been made in Hungary, maybe. Tools by this brand here were also used by the East German army. We would pronounce this Tona in German but I think that it's actually from Czechoslovakia and probably pronounced differently. But I need confirmation for that. Please leave a comment if you know more about it. Unior tools, that's at least how I would pronounce that, are from Slovenia. We encountered them before in another video a few months ago, and I must say that they really look fantastic. Russia, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Slovenia. It's really hard to research the origin of tools from Eastern European countries from before the fall of the Iron Curtain. Comments and opinions by viewers from those parts are really welcome here. Another object that I want to have a look at is this bench power supply here. It was built sometime between 1979 and 1983. Most components are from 79, but some of the capacitors have 1983 date codes. They could be replacements though. In the collectivized economy of the GDR, devices by many different manufacturers had the RFT label. The company behind this power supply is Statron though, which still exists today. And I give them a lot of credit for having technical documentation and even circuit diagrams for free on their website, at least for their older models. And we're going to have a look at the diagram in just a minute. The lab power supply seems to work just fine. There is one minor issue though that I want to fix before doing anything else. The protective glass of the voltmeter has shattered at some point and this makes the meter very sensitive. Touching it the wrong way just once could damage it beyond repair. In order to take care of this problem I will have to open the enclosure though. After unscrewing four little bolts on the front panel we can pull everything out of the housing. The insides are super dusty and at first I started to wipe off some of the dust manually. At this point the compressor was still down but I actually took care of that issue in the meantime and we will remove that dust properly in just a minute. The voltmeter on the left is screwed to the front panel from its back side but there are also several wires soldered to its two electrical contacts. After taking some pictures I started to desolder those connections and then I removed the tiny M3 nuts holding it in place. I was then able to remove it from the front panel. With the help of a screwdriver I was able to pop that gray frame off and this is what used to hold an actual piece of glass. But only a few shards remain inside the meter's enclosure and I make sure to remove them all. I'm now going to use a piece of transparent plastic to replace the glass. It's rather the thicker version of an old overhead projector transparency. It should be sturdy enough to protect the meter though. After holding it close to the meter several times and cutting away some more material, I managed to get it to just the right size. After carefully placing it inside the vise, with almost no pressure of course, I used the tip of a small screwdriver to apply a number of tiny droplets of super glue to the frame and carefully put the transparency in place. Just to be careful, I waited a day or so for the glue to harden and the meter was reinstalled. It will protect the meter from dust and from people's fingers. For some reason there is this urge to tap against the meter sometimes. In the meantime I also did some repair work on a number of compressors, which will be covered in a future episode. And so I was finally able to get rid of all the dust. I also want to have a look at the device itself and discover how it works. But at first let me tell you about some use cases here because I'm not sure if everybody knows what a lab power supply could even be used for. Now one of the great features of a power supply like this 
is that it can supply variable voltages at relatively high currents, in this case 10 amps. And that means that you can charge all kinds of things via the bench power supply if you just don't own the original charger or if you don't have it at hand. The laptop here is at this point running off the old GDR power supply. Here is a lead acid battery and I connected um, a small diode to it. And now we can charge the battery with this lab power supply. Now in repair work, you also often want to limit the current that is allowed to flow inside a given load. This can prevent a device under test from being damaged. Yeah, these are just some use cases, but actually there's a million things you can do with a bench power supply and you actually need this in every electronics lab. But let's have a look at the device itself and discover how it works. Let's start with its main components. We find two identical mains transformers working in conjunction. On this heatsink, we also find two thyristors right next to a pair of diodes. And in the middle of the enclosure, we find a capacitor bank comprised of 11 4,700 microfarad electrolytic capacitors. At least the ones in the front here were made in 1983. We also find a relay and another big heatsink holding two diodes and a single power transistor manufactured by Tesla in Czechoslovakia. In case you didn't know that there actually was a company called Tesla long before Tesla Motors, you might be interested in hearing that Tesla Motors actually had a trademark dispute with this company a number of years ago. On the bottom side, we also find a third mains transformer with various secondary windings, as well as two printed circuit boards that can be detached from the device. These seem to be two big wire wound resistors. So these are some of its main components, but how do they work together? So the principal answer is that the two transformers are connected to a rectifier that is comprised of two diodes and two thyristors. They charge a very sizable capacitor bank, which is then followed by a bipolar junction transistor that basically forms a variable voltage divider with whatever load you connect to the power supply. Say the capacitors are charged to a value somewhat higher than 30 volts. And for simplicity's sake, let's say it's exactly 30 volts. The voltage drop across the transistor collector emitter path will be those 30 volts minus the chosen output voltage, here, for example, roughly 20 volts. That would mean that a voltage drop of 10 volts occurs in the transistor. Let's say two amps are flowing through it. This would mean that 20 watts are dissipated, which is the reason you need a big heatsink. The larger the voltage difference and the current flowing, the higher the heat losses. In other words, depending on the operating point, a linear power supply like this can be rather inefficient. But in a lab environment, that is normally not an important factor. Much more important is the question of how pure and well stabilized the output voltage is. Apart from this principal idea, the realities of actually designing a device like this go far beyond these most basic considerations. It just so happens that I have a number of different linear power supplies on my bench at the moment, some of which need to be repaired. And we will eventually cover that in one of my videos and then I will explain in detail how this one here works. We will now have a look at the overgrown piece of land and after that I have a few important announcements to make. So now that we've taken care of the items we brought home, let's have a look at that piece of property that I explored at the end of my journey. There are small buildings somewhere on this property, but nobody ever lived here. It is the kind of property that people would spend their free time at. Gardening, beekeeping, processing fruits and vegetables, sleeping and living in what we might call a tiny house today. In fact, in East Germany, it was sort of common to have a place like this. It was referred to as a Dutsche, from the Russian word dacha, where this concept had originated. And it was often families who lived in very small city apartments who would flee the cities on the weekends to spend time in nature. Many dachen would have been smaller than this property though. Much of the land is located on the side of a wooded hill. It is not super steep though, and you could explore this entire piece of land on foot. At 10,000 square meters or about two and a half acres, this is an unusually large piece of land. I'm aware that in other countries you might often find much larger pieces of land up for sale, 
But this is Germany, a densely populated country in the middle of Europe. Many people build houses on 600 square meter plots of land. This piece is more than 16 times larger than that. Just for a size comparison, here is some grassland near my hometown. It's maybe 5,000 square meters. The overgrown property that we're going to have a look at here is almost twice that size. The overgrown property that we're walking towards here is almost twice that size, which is pretty cool to call your own, especially when it's so overgrown with trees that it's virtually impossible for nosy outsiders to see what is going on on that piece of land. At first, I tried to get access from the top of the hill, walking down, but it seemed nearly impossible to do without getting a million scratches from thorny bushes blocking the way or stumbling over roots or branches. So instead I walked down into the valley and then I tried to drive my car up to the property from down here. An old access road exists, but it was kind of a gamble to drive the Subaru up this dirt road. You couldn't really see, for example, if there are any big rocks blocking the way, potentially damaging the vehicle. I had to stop at this point because a branch had broken off and was blocking the path. Good that I always have some bushcrafting equipment in the car. Among other things, a small hatchet. So after clearing the path, I only could drive a few more meters anyway, since the old dirt road was simply completely overgrown from here on. This is basically where the property begins, by the way. I also wanted to see the boundaries of this plot of land, so I also tried to film it from the outside. Everything that is wooded here is part of it. The fields and meadows next to it are used for farming. Once on the property, I could see that some of it is actually almost a plateau and you could drive a car up here, at least when it's dry. A lot of the old trees are apple and other fruit trees that would have been planted here by the former owners decades ago. This was actually an orchard. After walking around somewhat aimlessly between the trees, I managed to find this yellow shack here. Next to a rusty steel tank, what we have here is an old beekeeper's shed, painted yellow. It appears to be all wooden construction. The door was open and inside we found a complete mess, of course. A lot of equipment that was stored here at one point is still there. It's hard to say if the old building is still dry enough to renovate it or if it would have to be rebuilt completely, which is something that I wouldn't even shy away from. Just a few meters from here, we find another small building. It's made from wood, it seems, but it was erected on a foundation made from either concrete or at least some masonry. I had a hard time to even film the front of this tiny house, since there are so many bushes in front of it that you could hardly move away from it. I had to fight my way through the thorny blackberry bushes until I could reach the door handle. Luckily, the door was unlocked. Now, I know, I know, earlier in this episode I told you that I don't usually walk into buildings that might collapse over me. The ceiling looks like it's damaged from humidity, but this building seemed still sturdy enough to hang in there for another five minutes and I hadn't come here for nothing.
a couch, a bunk bed, two rooms, three windows, curtains still in place, a small attic with yet another window. What more do you even need in life? Again, this structure might be a complete basket case and you would probably have to completely rebuild this. Approaching it from the other side, we find an old barbecue grill and can see the roof. If one were to build a completely new structure here, maybe you could build on the old foundations and also reuse those roof tiles. I know this is probably completely insane and even just cutting back the brushes and trees on this property would be a colossal undertaking. Rebuilding the wooden sheds would also be extremely hard, especially since it's not easy to even haul new materials up here. But I'm of course really tempted to do something like this. What do you think? Please leave a comment under the video. So I'm selling these beautiful maps as well as the two toolboxes plus an assortment of tools that will come with each box. And I'm also even considering to sell the bunker lamps. You can partake in an auction by filling out the Google form I posted under the video. Shipping to all countries around the world is possible and information concerning shipping costs and modes of payment can be found by clicking that link under the video. If you have a problem with the link, you can also send an email. And now an important announcement. Sorry if I sound overly dramatic here, but the internet has failed us. Now, I remember 15 years ago, or maybe it was more like 20 years ago, somebody showing me a video on their laptop for the first time that was an online video. And it must have been something like a guy jumping into a cactus, something, you know, straight from MTV's Jackass, but homebrew. And at the time, especially, you know, people who were a little older than me at the time would automatically assume that online videos are something silly, you know, funny short clips, essentially. And, you know, at the time I recognized that the same technology could, of course, be used for something much better. And a lot of people recognized it, I think. So we have this entire development where people spent their entire lives um, coming up with proper documentaries on YouTube and stuff like that. And of course, a lot of that exists as one branch of online video. But you have to admit that the general trend kind of goes in the polar opposite direction. And I'm talking about TikTok, Instagram Reels and YouTube Shorts here, where people basically watch short funny clips uh, like somebody showed me uh, back in 2003. Independent of what both me and you want, the system could just decide from one day to the other to not recommend my videos anymore and everything would just fall apart. A community built over a time span of 10 years would simply fade away. If my channel would ever be stolen or banned, for example, my voice would be completely muted and I couldn't even tell you what had happened. For that reason, I want to build something else that will be independent of this general trend. A real world community that can exist outside of the ups and downs of a site like YouTube. I already meet with viewers in real life on a regular basis and I have done that in Germany, the UK, Mexico and Slovenia and will continue to do that whenever I travel to other places. Maybe regular meetups could also occur right here. Alternative communication channels are needed. It could be anything from a Discord server to amateur radio for all I care. However, these things will need time to be organized. And the first step is to establish an alternative way to reach you guys. And I will start with an email newsletter. Under the video, you will find a link where you can sign up for that newsletter. In it, I will inform you about what is currently going on in the workshop, where I will travel next in case you want to meet, and everything else concerning building the community. Subscribing to the newsletter will also be the best way to make sure that I will always have a voice, even if content like the one I make will eventually be buried by all the noise and nonsense that social media is being flooded with. Independent of all that, I still hope that you liked this video and support the ideas that I have just talked about. If you liked it and would like to see more content like this, please give the video a thumbs up it is really important to me. See you soon.